This morning we are going to come talk about a very important topic of complete forgiveness in Christ. John MacArthur says, Forgiveness is perhaps the most exciting and comforting doctrine in all of Scripture because it is what, it is what guilty sinners need to be made right with God. This most important topic of forgiveness is all throughout the Bible. It, it could be argued that it is, it is the central theme of the Bible. Just listen to a few of these passages from Scripture. Psalm 32, 1, where the psalmist declares, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The Lord declares our forgiveness in Isaiah 1, 18 by saying that though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Micah 7, 8 declares the awesomeness and uniqueness of God by saying, Who is like God? Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression. We see it in the, in the New Testament where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper and he declares, uh, he t teaches the disciples about the blood of his covenant. And he, and he says, this my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In Acts 10, 43, the apostles declare that everyone who believes in Christ receives forgiveness of sins through his name. We could go on and on, but the point is forgiveness is a central theme throughout the Bible. And like we said, it could be argued that it is the central theme throughout the Bible, God's pursuit and redemption of his people. So this morning, we are going to look at Colossians chapter 2. If you aren't open there already, go ahead and open with me to Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And before, before we read these verses, let me remind you of the context of these verses in case you weren't here last week. So last week, we looked at the larger passage, which started back in verse 8. If you look back in your Bible and read that warning that Paul gives us in verse 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So we had this, this foundational warning laid. Do not be taken captive by this false teaching. And then we looked at four things that Paul gives us, or four reasons that he gives us in this passage for how we can stand firm against that false teaching. In case you weren't here, or in case you need a reminder, those were that we remember our Savior is fully God. We remember that we have complete fullness in Christ. We, we remember that we have a complete salvation. And the final one in verses 13 through 15 is that we remember we have complete forgiveness. And it's that point that we are going to talk about this morning. If you remember, we ran out of time last week, and I wanted to do justice to those verses this morning and cover those. So look with me starting in verse 13 of Colossians 2. <clears throat> and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So as we work through this passage this morning, here, here's how I would summarize the passage. And I think the guys are working on getting the screen up, and, and it'll be up in just a minute. And we've got this, this sentence up for you. But here's how I would summarize this passage. We who are dead and debtors, God raised and rescued through Christ's victorious death and resurrection. I know that's a mouthful, but we're going to repeat that a few times through the morning. Let me say it again. We who were dead and debtors, God raised and rescued through Christ's victorious death and resurrection. So we're going to walk through that summary and look at these verses and see what it is that Paul teaches us this morning about our complete forgiveness in Christ. So let's start first with this topic of who we were. So we who were dead and debtors, who we were. As we look at these verses, Paul's description, and in fact, the entire New Testament, the entire Bible's description of who you and I are outside of Christ is not a very pretty picture. In, in, in this passage alone, he uses two bits of in, imagery, those two D words, dead and debtors. Now, before we talk about these two things, let me ask you this question. Why is this important? Why is this important for us as believers in Christ to remember who we were. Well, before we talk about us as Christians, if you're not a Christian here this morning, 
if, if you're not a Christian here this morning, it's supremely important, right? You must understand who you are as a dead sinner in debt to God. And we're going to talk about that this morning. But if you are a Christian this morning, you should never forget from where you came. You and I as believers in Christ should never forget who we were outside of Christ. I've, I've been a Christian for 11 years. Many of you in this room have been a believer multiple times that, 30, 40 years. So I, surely what I've experienced in my life, you have experienced maybe double, triple fold. In my 11 years as a believer, I have seen the temptation creep into my life to begin to think that I'm not really that bad. To begin to think that I'm actually pretty good because of what God has done in me. I, I'm, I'm really not that bad of a sinner. That is Satan tempting me, my flesh tempting me to forget who I was outside of Christ. Whatever the reason is, pride can easily and often creep up in the Christian's life. And it's a humbling and a very important thing for us as believers to remember who we were before Christ saved us. As we think about the topic, if you are not a believer here this morning, if you are not a believer or you're not even quite sure what the gospel is, you've heard this language of the gospel, you've heard that you should go to church, you've heard that you should believe in God, but you're, you can't quite articulate what the gospel is. It's so important for you to be reminded from God's word what it says about who you are. As one preacher has said, before we can get people saved, we have to get them lost. You can't understand the good news until you understand the bad news. So let's talk about this topic of who we were. First, we were dead. We were dead. Look at verse 13 again with me. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. So let's pause right there. You were dead in your trespasses. This, this word trespasses here is a word that refers to our sinful actions. Literally, it means a false step or crossing over a known boundary. And he goes on, he says, you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. That could refer to a couple things. Some think that he's speaking of Gentiles here as those who were not circumcised in the flesh. I don't think that's what he's referring to because of how I interpret verse 11 through 12 that we talked about last week. I think what he's talking about here is that they were uncircumcised in their sinful nature, that they had not received what he talked about in verse 11, this circumcision made without human hands. Right, so he is reminding them, before you came to Christ, you were dead in your sins and your heart was uncircumcised. You had not received what I just talked about in verse 11. The doctrine that Paul is teaching here, the doctrine that we are reminded here in these verses, is this doctrine of the depravity of man, or spiritual deadness. It's a, it's a somber reality throughout all of Scripture that we humans in our natural state from birth are dead in our sins. Now, what does that mean? Right? If, if you've grown up in church, you may hear churchy language and it makes sense to you. Dead in our sins. Okay, we got that. But if you haven't, if you don't, if you don't know what that means, we, we need to understand what that means. And I think it's important for us to do so by looking at a few other passages of Scripture that help shed some light for us on what it means that we were dead in sins outside of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Paul's, and I've got these listed here for you just for future reference. 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul speaks of our spiritual deadness by saying this, that the natural person, listen to this, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Why is that? He says, for they are folly to him. So the natural man outside of Christ, every human being outside of Christ in their natural spiritual condition thinks the things of God are just silly, thinks they're foolish, they're folly to him. Ephesians 4.18 Paul characterizes our spiritual deadness as being uh, that we are darkened in our understanding and alienated from the life of God. Romans 3, quoting, quoting Psalm 14, declares this, There is no one righteous, no, not one. There is none who seeks after God. There is none who does good, no, not one. And it gets even clearer in Romans 8, 7 through 8. The mind that is set on the flesh, as Paul, Paul's there, the, not, the mind that is set on the flesh is contrary to the mind of the spirit, right? So mind of the spirit, believers, mind that is set on the flesh is unbelievers. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, enemies of God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And finally, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, you're probably very familiar with as you think about this, this topic of the deadness of, of, our un, of our natural man. Paul says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins, and once you once walked, sound familiar? That's 
But basically what he's saying here in Colossians 2, listen to this. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience. And he goes on to say that we were by nature children of wrath. That's not a very pretty picture, is it? As you think about us, me and you, outside of Christ, that is not a pretty picture. Let me, just, let me just summarize very quickly what we just saw in those five passages. Outside of Christ, we, every single one of us, you and I, don't accept the things of God because they're foolish. Our minds and our understandings are darkened. We're ignorant. We're not righteous because no one is. We don't seek after God because no one does. And we're not good because no one is. And then it gets worse. We're hostile to God. We're God's enemies. We don't submit to God's law. We can't because that would go against our very nature. We were children of wrath. And listen to this. We were willing disciples of Satan. That's what he said there in Ephesians 2, right? Have you ever thought about that? He says that we were following the prince of the power of the air. That is Satan. We were willing disciples of Satan. And we didn't have a problem with it. Why? We loved it. Why? Because it was our nature. That's who we are outside of Christ. Outside of Christ, we are dead. Here's how John MacArthur defines this. We are so bound in the sphere of sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil, that we're unable to respond to spiritual stimuli. Brothers and sisters, we need to be reminded this morning, as we, look, as we begin to turn our attention to what Christ has done for us in forgiveness, we need to remember who we were outside of Christ. This is who you were. This is who I was. I was dead in my sin. I was, as the song goes, as the hymn goes, I was running my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost. And so were you. You were not just following a bad path and decide to turn around. You were not just seeking God and finally found him. You were dead and God had to resurrect you to new life. If you were not in Christ this morning, this describes you this very morning. You may think yourself alive, and you are physically. You are sitting there breathing. You are physically alive, but spiritually, you are dead. That's what the Bible says about us. Secondly, we were debtors. We were debtors. So we were dead, and we were debtors. Look at verse 14 with me. We're going to skip for a minute what he says God has done for us in this. We're just going to look at what he talks about in verse 14 about who we were. He talks about the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Now, most of us this morning understand in some capacity this concept of debt, right? The majority of us owe some kind of money or we have in the past on a car, a house, a student loan, something. And if you're like me, this debt can be somewhat burdensome, right? Depending on the amount of it, depending on the length of it. But even though it can be kind of burden, burdensome, we can at least see the light at the end of the tunnel, right? Even if, that lot, even if that tunnel's 30 years long, right? We're energized by the hope that one day that debt will be paid in full. One day we will receive a paper from our creditors releasing us from that debt and any further obligation. But imagine with me, being burdened with a debt from which you will never be set free. It's simply too much for most of us to comprehend. Then take that a step further, extending that indebtedness and extending that penalty that it incurs into eternity. And that becomes horrific beyond words. This is the reality of our spiritual indebtedness to God outside of Christ. That word that, he, that trans, is translated in our English Bibles there in verse 14, the record of debt, refers to basically an IOU. It refers, it, the, the word literally means something written with the hand or an autograph. And it refers to a signed acknowledgement of our indebtedness. It was used back in this time to refer to a certificate of indebtedness handwritten by the debtor acknowledging his debt. As one author puts, puts it, it's as, as if we have an IOU written and signed by all mankind. I owe God obedience to his will signed mankind. This is the reality of each and every one of us ever created by God. By virtue of our very creation by this God, we were created by him and for his glory. We were created, you were created in this room, every single one of us and every single one of us ever created in this world, in this county, in all of history, were created to honor and give thanks to God. 
We were created to live in accordance with his will laid out in scripture, particularly the Mosaic law. And each and every one of us from the moment of birth and from our first transgression of sin have broken that covenant. We have transgressed that law. And as such, there is a record of debt, an IOU that stands against you. There is wrath upon that. There's a penalty upon that debt that must be paid upon that sin. And look, look what he says at the, in the rest of verse 14. He talks about this record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. That's language of condemnation. That's language of, of something must be paid. It, some, I think the NASB, or at least some of the translations, speak about this debt that was hostile to us. It was hostile against us. Our violation of God's law and this certificate of debt that stands on you this very morning, if it has not been paid by Christ, is enough to condemn us to judgment and hell for eternity. This is who we were outside of Christ. But praise the Lord, we aren't going to stop there this morning, right? That is not the end of the story. That would be a pretty bleak and depressing time to get up this morning and come and say, man, I'm dead and I'm a debtor, right? That is not the end of the story. Praise God that that is not the end. Let me remind you again of this summary that we are working through. We who were dead and debtors, that's who, where we've gotten to so far, God raised and rescued through Christ's victorious death and resurrection. So we've looked at who we were. Now let's look at what God has done, what God has done. We see two things in this passage. First, we see that he has raised us. Look back at verse 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, that's who we were. Look at what God did. God made alive together with him. Think about that with me for just a minute. Think about what we just talked about, that you were dead, that you were a debtor. Think about the miraculousness of that short, simple phrase. God made you alive together with Christ. You who were dead, God resurrected. You who had no life, God imparted new life. You who had a sinful, dead heart, God gave new and alive hearts. This is the miraculous new birth that you and I as children of God have experienced. And notice here who the subject is. You'll notice as I, as I said those sentences, who is the subject that's doing the action here? It's God. Who made us alive with Christ? God. Did I make me alive? Nope. Did my parents make me alive? No. Did a pastor or a friend or anyone else make me alive? No. God made us alive together with Christ. Why is that? Because only he can. God must initiate salvation because spiritually dead people can get, get, guess how much spiritually dead people can do? Nothing. They're dead. God is the author, sustainer, and finisher of our faith. And why do you think that is? I think it's because or so that he alone gets all the praise and glory. He alone gets all the praise and glory. If I could muster up in myself enough willpower to turn away from my bondage to sin and turn to Christ. And if it was ultimately, ultimately me who was responsible for that, who would get the glory for that? Me. But dead people are just that. They are dead. As you and I look back to your salvation, as you and I look back to that moment where you turn from sin to righteousness, where you turn from death to to life. Whether that was 50 years ago or 50 days ago, you can rest assured that it was God that began that work in you. It was God who changed your heart. It was God who enabled you to believe. It was God who made you alive together with Christ, and it is God who gets all the praise and glory for that. What a gracious God we serve, that he would raise sinners to life. He's not only raised us, but secondly, he has rescued us. He has rescued. That, that, is, that is how he has made us alive together with Christ, by rescuing us from sin and the penalty that our sin incurred. Look back at verse 13 with me. I'm going to read through quickly, and we're going to focus on verse 14. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. Listen to this. Having forgiven us all our trespasses. Now, how did he do that? Look at verse 14. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Notice with me a few key words in this passage that helps us understand the reality of what's going on. Look at that word that he has done to our record of debt. He has canceled it. 
canceled the record of debt. Now, that, that English word cancel isn't, isn't very strong in our languages. I mean, I, I can talk about canceling my Netflix subscription, right? That doesn't carry a lot of weight to it. I can cancel a date that I had planned. I mean, it can carry weight, that word can, but it, but it doesn't necessarily carry a ton of weight behind that word cancel. But the word that Paul uses here is the Greek word exalepho. It carries with it a much stronger idea than canceling. It carries with it this idea of eliminating, wiping out, blotting out, destroying, or obliterating. That carries strong. He, he obliterated our record of debt. He completely wiped it out. It, it's the word that Peter uses in his sermon in Acts 3 when he says, repent and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Same word right there. Re Revelation 7, 17 and 21, 4 is the same word used to describe the wiping away of every tear from our eyes. Same word right there. And it's used over 50 times in the Old Testament, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, most notably in Isaiah 43, 25, where God says, I, I am he, here's the word, who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. That's the idea that Paul is communicating here. When we see he has canceled the record of debt, it means that he has completely done away with it. He has wiped it away and it no longer exists for those in Christ. It's been completely satisfied. It's been paid in full. It's as if, as if listen to this, as if it never existed in the first place. Can you imagine that? The record of debt that stood against us for all of our sins against this holy and righteous God has been completely paid in full and it's as if it never existed in the first place. God wipes it away. He obliterates it. But how did this happen? Have you ever thought about that? How did this happen? How did God just wipe away this record of debt? God didn't simply just take that piece of paper and tear it up. Say, ah, it's all good. Let bygones be bygones right? This infinitely righteous God cannot pretend that our indebtedness never existed. So how did it happen? How did he cancel or wipe away or blot out this record of debt? This brings up what, what I'm referring to as the biggest problem in scripture. The biggest problem in scripture is this, how can a just God forgive sinners? It, some may think that the biggest problem in scripture is how to explain evil in a world controlled by God. Or perhaps you think the biggest problem in scripture is understanding how God can be one God and three persons. Or perhaps it's reconciling God's sovereignty and human responsibility. And all of those are complicated issues for sure. And they re require a lot of time and mental em energy to wrap our heads around. But I'm going to propose that the biggest problem in scripture is not any of these. It's actually much bigger than that. It's a simpler explanation than that, but it's actually a much bigger problem. It's the issue of how a holy, righteous God can forgive sins. Now, listen to what Proverbs 17, 15 says. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both an abomination to the Lord. So ask yourself this question with me this morning. How is it that God can be forgive sin? How is it that God can, in the language of Proverbs 17, justify the wicked and not be an abomination? against himself. We all love this topic of forgiveness, right? Especially if we're on the receiving end of forgiveness. But when you think about the perfect, righteous, holy, just God of the universe, how can he forgive sin? Sin that is against his very character. Sin that is against his very righteous law. Sin that is divine treason against his lordship over the earth. How can he do it? Look at the rest of verse 14. This he set aside nailing it to the cross. That's the answer right there. That is the answer to this very difficult question. He did not and he cannot. Listen clearly, if you, if you have never thought about this topic, he did not and cannot simply let bygones be bygones and say, it's all good. I'm just not going to remember that anymore. The debt had to be paid and it was paid through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. This is the beautiful doctrine of propitiation and substitutionary atonement on our behalf. These are both big words, so I just want to take just a moment to explain them for us. Substitutionary atonement. 
on the cross. Jesus went to the cross, listen to this, on our behalf, as our substitute, the righteous for the unrighteous. He paid in full that record of debt for his people. We see this truth all throughout God's word. Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 12, he bore the sin of many. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, probably the most important in this regard. For our sake, he, God the Father, made him, Christ, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We could go on. You can look at those in your own time. Galatians 3, 13, Hebrews 9, 28, 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself, Christ, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Jesus Christ, the perfect son of God, 100% God and 100% man, became sin on our behalf, taking the judgment that we deserved. In another way, our sins were imputed to Christ. He became our substitute. That is the answer for how God can forgive sinners. Because he didn't just wipe it away as if it never existed. He took that judgment and laid it on someone else. He took that judgment that was mine. He took that judgment that is yours, that you justly and righteously deserve. And he took that and he laid it on Christ as a substitute. The next word that we said is this word propitiation. It's another word that we just don't use in our language, but it's a word all throughout the Bible. And it's a word that refers to a sacrifice that bears God's wrath. Those three passages there, Romans 3, 25, 1 John 2, 2, 1 John 4, 10, all speak of Jesus being a propitiation for our sins. So what does this mean? As Jesus Took, as Jesus took our sins on himself, on the cross, he not only just took the sins on himself, he took the sins on himself to where God's wrath was poured out on him. His wrath was satisfied on the cross for the sins of all who would turn from their sins and turn to him. As one person has put it, at the cross, God saves us from himself. At the cross, God saves us. From himself. We sang this this morning. I asked Josiah if we could do in Christ alone this morning. For this very reason, we sang this in the second verse. To own the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. You know, a few years ago, the, the liberal side of the Presbyterian Church, was the, which is the PCUSA, PCA, great, uh, godly, reformed, conservative branch of the Presbyterian Church, but the, the PCUSA, Presbyterian Church of, of USA, actually actually tried to pressure the Gettys who wrote that song in Christ's song. I actually tried to pressure them to remove that verse from the song because it offended them. They, they, they didn't want to think about or talk about it. They don't believe that the wrath of God was satisfied in Christ. Praise the Lord that the Gettys refused to do so, and it was removed from all of the hymnals in the PCUSA. But the reason the Gettys re refused to remove this from their, from their song is that this is a crucial element of the gospel. You don't have the gospel. If you remove this from our language, on the cross, in the very death of Jesus Christ our Lord, God satisfied his wrath against his people. Let's continue to the last part of our summary. We who were dead and debtors, God raised and rescued through Christ's victorious death and resurrection. Let's look at verse 15 as we close this morning. At the result... The result of this work, the result of this work that Christ did, not, not only for us, but in a cosmic, big picture kind of way. Look at verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Let me just make sure we understand who a few words are in this verse. Look at, look at verse 15. It says, he, that would be God the Father, continuing on the same subject. He, God the Father, disarmed the rulers and authorities. That would be Satan and his demons, as Paul uses that phrase throughout the book of Colossians. So, he, God the Father, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him, that being Christ. So, let's look at these two verbs to understand what's going on. The first is that he disarmed them. This word literally means to strip off. In chapter 2, verse 11, the word is referred to Christians who strip off their body of sin. 
Or in later in chapter 3, verse 9, it refers to Christians stripping off their old self. And here is the same word that God uses to speak of the Satan and his demons having their power stripped off. He disarmed them. He, he stripped off their power from them on the cross. Sure, we still see Satan working, right? Satan still works today. His demons still work today, tempting and deceiving and doing all those things that he does. But his ultimate power is gone. His ultimate power, he never had ultimate power, right? But his, his ultimate power that he thought he had under God's rulership, his ultimate power is gone on the cross as, as Jesus took, as Jesus went to the cross as our substitute and took on himself the sins of his people and paid the wrath of God. All, at that moment, Satan and his demons were dealt a fatal blow where they were disarmed from their power. The second thing he says here is that he put them to open shame. That word put them there refers to a, an exposing publicly. So this disarming that God the Father did to Satan and his demons was made a public spectacle. And this happened at the resurrection of Christ. At the cross, God disarmed Satan. And at the resurrection and ascension, God made that victory public for all the world to see. We see this communicated in a few places. Ephesians 1, 20 through 21 talks about God's power that he worked when he raised Christ from the dead. Romans 1, 4 talks about Jesus was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit by, of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. So at the cross, God strips off the power of Satan and the rulers. And at the resurrection and ascension, he exposes them publicly as the defeated enemies that they are. And look at the rest of the language that he uses here. It's beautiful imagery that God uses, or that Paul uses through the inspiration of God, by triumphing over them in him. The word translated triumphing here refers to the Roman custom of awarding victorious generals a victory parade. So as a, as a general went to war and he was victorious, they would hold a parade for him. And behind the general, as he rode in splendor through the city, would follow prisoners in chains from the successful campaign that he just concluded. This is the imagery that Paul is using to refer to Christ's victory over sin and demons through his death and resurrection. He's disarmed them. He's stripped off their power. Then he put them to open shame for all the world to see that they have been defeated. And in so doing, Christ, as it were, engaged in a victory parade where his spoils of war followed behind him. Satan and his demons, captive prisoners who have been defeated once and for all. Now let's, let's think about this, this topic of our complete forgiveness, verse 13 through 15 that we've been talking about. Let's, let's think about this and, and keep it in context of where we were last week, verse 8. And let me ask you this question. In light of all of this, in light of all that God has done on your behalf and my behalf, in light of who you were as a dead debtor, in light of what God has done in raising you and rescuing you, why would you look to anyone or anything else but Christ for fullness? That's the context that he's saying, right? Remember verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by empty philosophy. And he goes through all these things that we looked at last week. And then think about this truth here. Why would you look anywhere else? No one else can do what Christ has done. No other false teacher or false teaching, no other empty or deceptive philosophy can come close to the glories that's described in this passage. We have a Savior who's completely God, who has provided complete salvation and forgiveness, and through him we have complete fullness. That is the context of this passage that God wants us to remember this morning. As we live our Christian lives, as we fight the good fight, so to speak, and as we stand firm against all the false teachings that are coming our way. As we close this morning, I just want to end with a, with a few applications on forgiveness for you to think about. It, I, I want to make sure that we keep this in the context of, of, the, of the passage and, and standing against false teaching. But just in this aspect of the forgiveness of God, I, I want to just talk about three, three groups of people, maybe, that are here and how this truth should bear on you and your life. First, we have to ask this question have you received God's forgiveness? Have you received God's forgiveness? Perhaps some of you this morning have never truly tasted of it. 
Today is the day of salvation. Do not wait a day longer. Ponder these truths that we have discussed today. Ponder these truths that there is a debt that stands against you that you can never pay. That you are dead in your sin. That no amount of good works, no amount of trying harder, no amount of turning your life around or going to church, no amount of money or anything else will enable you to pay that debt. There is one person that can pay it and there's one person that has paid it. The, the, the admonition of scripture, the admonition of Paul in this passage is turn to Christ. Trust in him. Turn away from your sin and turn to Christ. Though you may have never tasted of God's forgiveness, you can have it in its fullness this very morning. For some of us, we doubt God's forgiveness, right? So for some of us as, as believers, maybe you, you, have been, uh, you have been born again. You have trusted in Christ. You have been raised with him. But for whatever reason, you doubt God's forgiveness. Whether it's a, a past sin before you came to Christ, a, a past pattern of sin and a sinful life. Maybe it's a, a recent sin as a believer. You struggle to believe that God really completely and totally can forgive you. And I, I just want to take a, a moment to offer a gentle encouragement and sort of rebuke that though that may seem like humility, it's actually pride. It's actually pride. It's pride because you're believing in your own judgment about yourself rather than believing in the judgment that God has said about you in his word. Remember what God's word says. Remember what this passage says. Look at verse 13 and 14. Paul tells us here that all your transgressions have been canceled, wiped out, obliterated. You have been forgiven through the work of God, through the work of Christ on your behalf. Rest assured, brother and sister, if you are struggling with that past sin or that recent sin, don't, don't take it lightly. You must repent of that sin. But if you have repented of that, of that sin, if you have confessed that sin to the Lord and turned away from it, don't let that have weight on you anymore. You have been forgiven in Christ. Now, on the other hand, perhaps some of us presume on God's forgiveness. So, one group may doubt God's forgiveness, while another may use that forgiveness as a license for sin. We must be careful to guard against that as well. That ugly temptation of our heart to abuse the very glorious forgiveness that God has given us in Christ. I've seen this in my own life. I was confessing this to a, a brother even earlier this week, just confessing that I've seen this in my own life, that I find myself in a spot of temptation and our sinful self, our sinful flesh, Satan tempting us comes to this point and says, well, I know God's going to forgive me. And so we go ahead and engage in that sin. That is a dangerous thing to do. We must not presume on God's forgiveness. So we could spend a whole another sermon talking about this, but let me just read to you Romans 6, 1 through 2, that should sum it up well. Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to, to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Be sure that you do not presume upon God's forgiveness and abuse it as a license for sin. And as you go this afternoon, uh, whether the, the community group at Pastor Kevin's house, whether the uh, Will's community group, as you go this afternoon, be ready to discuss this this afternoon, uh, the struggles that you find in your life, whether it's never tasting of God's forgiveness, whether it's doubting his forgiveness, or whether it is presuming on it. And as we prepare to close our service this morning and sing this final song of praise to God, and then as we prepare to leave from this building, to go back to our families, to go back to our work, our neighbors, our friends, let us let this simple but profound truth of God's complete forgiveness of us in Christ transform every aspect of our lives. Let me read this sentence for you one more time. We who were dead and debtors, God raised and rescued through Christ's victorious death and resurrection. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. 